As I always say, hello, Tiger Bay. Hello. <laughs> and I'm so grateful to everyone who came out in this sort of crummy weather. Uh, it's been so beautiful for so long, we got very spoiled. But there was a tweet in my daughter's Twitter feed this morning. She lives in Pittsburgh. And she said, 18 degrees, that feels pretty good. Oh my god, what has this winter done to me? <laughs> so. Uh, no matter even if it's raining, at least we're not cold. Uh, I really want to welcome you today. And before we start, I'd like you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Uh, I have just a couple of announcements before we start the program. Um, happy birthday, Ben Bakker. He's a, a member of our Tiger Bay board and an officer of Tiger Bay. So welcome and so nice of you to join us on your birthday. Yay, Ben. <laughs> you will see our board members are sporting new name tags, and that is actually thanks to Ben. So I uh, appreciate that. You brought us a present. <laughs> Also, um, I wanted to remind people who are members and have not rejoined for this year that you kind of need to do that, please. And if you are uh, visiting and have not joined, please bear in mind that the privilege of membership is being able to ask questions. Uh, we welcome guests. We love having guests. It's wonderful to have guests, but guests do not get to ask questions. So when we get to the question and answer period, I'll be saying, please state your name and that you're a member of Tiger Bay and, and then ask your question. So if you're not a member um, and you want to ask a question, you might want to join right now. Um, <laughs> I am very excited about uh, our programs this year. We have some interesting issues coming up. Uh, the next meeting will be about land use planning, which is a near and dear to my heart. I'm a big person. I was telling Misty earlier, I've always really thought that zoning had a lot to do with the quality of life and the character of people's communities, but it's kind of the unsung hero of uh, development and redevelopment. So we're going to be talking about infill, uh, sort of the new buzzword in land use, and that'll be an exciting program next time. This time, uh, we are talking about how, the, how in the heck you pay for things we all want. And uh, this is part of a national debate. Obviously, we're having a local discussion of it, but this is, you know, this is the big issue of our time, is um, how are we going to do all the things? The public really doesn't like driving on bad roads and, and wants access to things, and we want our children to go to the finest possible physical plant as well as well-staffed schools, and those are just two examples in the entire panoply of services that we, are, we demand as the public. Uh, but we also have a real uh, desire not to be in, in increasing the cost of government. So uh, we have that issue is going to be raised today by our four speakers. We have um, very privileged to have Bob Gauze, who is uh, the vice president of Allison Gauze, Inc., but as you all, you all know him very well from the school board as well and obviously has a huge commitment to school issues. We have Michael Howe, who is the executive director of the Metropolitan Planning Organization, has one of the most painful uh, jobs. If you want to know how geologic time works, you just hang around with people who build roads and pay for them. And he's got the patience of a saint, but he's kind of the person that decides what's going to get, uh, or helps to decide what's going to get fixed and how are we going to spend our road money, uh, federal, state, combined with local, and when federal and state money dries up, we have a serious problem. Um, he'll be talking to that. We have um, Ernest Marshall, who is, uh, I always forget the name of your organization, okay, Manatee County Community 
County Community Associations. Federation of Manatee County Community, Community Associations. Associations. And uh, of course, uh, that's an organization pretty dedicated to us not spending more money than we have or have to. And as is Steve Vernon, who represents the Manatee Tea Party. So uh, the order of speakers is just based on logic and um, so we keep the, the topic going. The speakers can interact with each other during the question period. When we get to the question period, you go to the microphone, you ask your question. I will um, stop people who make a speech instead of asking a question. So if I nicely say, could you please ask your question, uh, please do so, or I'm the next thing out of my mouth might be, could you please sit down? Um, we do time the speakers. And I'm not going to announce them again. They're going to speak in the order in which, um, uh, starting with, with uh, Michael and then Bob and then uh, Ernie and then Steve. Uh, so they will stand up and start speaking one at a time. And we're going to start with Michael. my pleasure to be here today and I say that sincerely I enjoy talking about something that is critical to each of our lives each day from the time we get up in the morning to the time you come home at night and that's transportation that's mobility take a moment and imagine that you woke up this morning and it was 1914 a hundred years ago how would you have gotten here today? Well, if you had some money, maybe you had one of those fancy new car things. Uh, train, probably not. Uh, boat, not a good day for boating. Uh, horse and buggy, not a real good day for that, but you probably could have made it. And I dare say that you probably would have had to have started yesterday from some of the distances you traveled to get here for this luncheon meeting. In the 1900s, we experienced a transportation explosion, to use that term, a revolution, if you want to, uh, of our industry. What was uh, you know, something that was somewhat limited back in the 1800s, you know, obviously changed with the invention of the automobile, the airplane, uh, improved ship and navigation systems and this whole thing exploded and what were dirt roads turned into gravel and brick and concrete roads and soon we had developing state roadway systems we had developing a federal highway system and during that period you had to raise money, of course, for these needed improvements as we're having this large increase in the road building and public transportation, not to, not to exclude buses, which I've, I'm sure a lot of us experienced uh, in our earlier years and still do today. In 1932, President Herbert Hoover passed the first gas tax one cent that's what it was that was the federal gas tax and gas at 1932 was 10 cents a gallon so 10 percent tax basically pretty big deal but it didn't go to roads or infrastructure it was to help try to get the country out of the depression that was the purpose of it in the 1940s the tax was increased to 1.5 cents a gallon and uh, that was primarily to help fund the war effort during that period finally fast forwarding to the 1950s uh, Dwight Eisenhower based upon his experience in World War II and President Roosevelt's observations during World War II as president he determined that we need to do an interstate road building system that would connect, similar to the German Autobahn that they were very impressed with, the entire nation. Thus, in 1956, 
the Federal Highway Revenue Act was passed that said we will dedicate our gas tax revenue to this interstate building project. It took 25 years, and it's still today one of the better systems in the entire world as far as an interstate uh, you know, system of, of roadway connections. Fast forward now to, and there were periodic changes uh, regarding tax revenues and everything, but fast forward to 1983. That was the last time that the federal gas tax was raised in our nation, signed by Ronald Reagan, a five cent increase. It went to 18.4 cents a gallon, which it is currently today. Um, still, you know, 30 years later. So it, it, it's, uh, it's been a, a long period of time with a lot of changes that have occurred. Inflation has increased the cost of maintaining the road system. The cost of labor has increased. The cost of building new capacity improvements has increased dramatically. And it's not the same country. And the other big issue that a lot of people don't understand about the federal gas tax is that it is based on a per gallon charge. So as I was saying, you know, in 1932, you had a 10 cent a gallon charge for gas. Um, now at the pump, it's what, about 350, you know, let's say average. Uh, about a 200% increase since 1983 in our gas prices at the pump. But we still don't bring in any more money because it's not indexed to inflation. It's not based on the price at the pump, it's based on the gallon. So it's still 18.4 cents, thus we're falling further and further behind. First time after 50 years since Dwight Eisenhower introduced this Federal Transportation Trust Fund in, 19, uh, in 2008, it ran a deficit of $5 billion that had to be supplemented with the General Revenue Fund. And then uh, ever since that 2008, it has increased. The estimated deficit this year on the federal level as far as and when I say deficit, I'm talking about being able to pay the bills, take care of the roadways, fix the road, fix the bridges, and maybe even do a, a few new things. It, it's going to be $20 billion. In 2017, it's going to be $17 billion. So that's the, the slippery slope we're on right now. And the question that is being begged is, how do you fix that? Well. The obvious one is to raise the gas tax, and there are proposals in Congress right now to do that. Um, 18 cents right now, uh, there's some proposals that want to double that. There's some proposals that want to take it up 10 cents you know, per gallon over the next uh, five years. So there's a lot of options out there. The other big discussion that's been going on now for probably about five to, to 10 years is to do a mileage-based user fee, similar to your utilities at home, you know, and, and say that if you drive from here to there, you're going to be charged per cents on, uh, for the miles you drove. There's a lot of issues with that because a lot of people, and there, there's been pilot programs that have been done with this, in Oregon in particular, most notable, and the people seem to adjust to it there was a GPS system that tracked how many miles they drove, and it charged them a per cent charge instead of the fuel charge. Now, there's other methodologies you can use. You can do it so that there's not this big brother aspect to it, which some people have trepidation about, you know, where you can actually go to the, 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 the pump, and they can just register how many miles you drove in the last month, and that's what your charge is going to be. But it still becomes a taxing and revenue issue that has to be determined on the big level at a big policy discussion. Um, I want to wrap up because I want to be sensitive to the time here, but user fee mileage, raise the gas tax, um, obviously some other options, public transportation, bicycle pedestrian trails,
That doesn't fix your transportation system, though, because you still have to maintain this. I mean, we built this world-class transportation network, and you're going to have to feed the system, you're going to have to maintain the system, and that costs money. And so we're going to have to address that issue. Congress is debating it. Every state in the union is a date de uh, debating it. But it's something that we need to really take a serious look at because we don't want to fall behind. We don't want to become a substandard transportation network because it is so critical, as I said, from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night. Anyways, thank you very much. I'll be looking forward to your questions. Hello. You know, I'm standing up here behind you. I'm looking up here in front of you. And I'm looking around this room, and I'm reminded of a time 20 plus years ago when Pat Neal stood up in front of a group of zoning and planning officials and introduced himself as a rancher. <laughs> At the time, he owned what was called, what's called Circle N Bar Ranch. I am speaking today as someone who grew up here in Manatee County and as a partner in uh, the firm Allison Gauze, which is a local engineering landscape architectural firm located here in Manatee County. We're a local firm, locally owned firm. Most of our business is in Manatee County, and our success will be determined by the success of this community. The success of your businesses will also be determined that way. You know, it's already been proven that the district was spending more money than it had available to spend. And um, that wasn't, and it isn't acceptable. What I think is important for everybody to also understand is that the district is projecting a year-end fund balance of $8.1 million at the end of this year. And it's being constantly monitored and, and encumbered to make sure that we know what it is. Now, there's the audit findings that could uh, impact or slow that recovery, but I'm pretty confident that it won't stop the recovery. So what I'm going to try and talk to you about, I mean, seven minutes, ten minutes, it's not enough time to talk about education in any real manner. But I'm going to try and educate you quickly on some facts that many people don't really know. And quite frankly, I didn't really understand it until I was elected to the school board. Um, the Florida Education Finance Program, you hear it sometimes referred to as the FEFP. What it is designed to do is it's designed to ensure that every student in the state of Florida gets the same funding per student regardless of whether they live in a wealthy county like Sarasota or a poor county like Gilchrist or somewhere like that. Now, the way that any, diff any school district, any county gets a little different from that is if they have a dedicated sales tax or an additional one mill uh, ta property tax or if a critical needs tax or you know, one of those fund impact fees. Um, it, of these, uh, Mantee County uh, takes advantage of the dedicated sales tax, half cent sales tax. Now, I want to try and give you some quick facts. The school district of Mantee County has a budget of about $568 million. It employs around 5,000 employees. And it attempts to educate 46,000 students, roughly. When you look at the budget, if you looked at the line item budget, what you would find is that there's over 10,000 codes, cost codes, line items. If you then take those line items and figure out how many different combinations go into making up those within the district, you would probably come in somewhere around 216 million. That's how big that budget is. And the unfortunate reality is that that appears to have been done very, been, being done very manually instead of using automated systems. And that's become much more clear over this last year, too. When you think about the general fund, $456 million, or $356 million, what you're looking at is 91% of those monies are spent on just four categories. Salaries and wages, that's about 58% of the spending. Fringe benefits, that's about another 17% of that spending. If you look at professional technical purchase services, which includes charter schools, because charter schools are funded through the school district budget. But that's about 13% of the budget. And if you look at how much the district spends on utilities, it's about 3% of the budget, or a little over $12 million is, is what's budgeted. The rest of it, that goes to things like textbooks, that other 9%, textbooks, um, printing, fuel, uh, supplies. 
Did you know that the school district budgets over $3 million just for substitute teachers? You know, when you think about the school district budget, you kind of have to understand the numbers. When you give a 1% pay raise in the school district, you're talking about a $3 million hit. I mean, that's what that really means. If you look at upgrading the IT system, which we have to do, the, the district has to do it. But when you look at what that number is, that's somewhere between six and $10 million of the numbers that I'm hearing. So, you know, you're not talking about small numbers, you're talking about big numbers. If you look at, you know, bus drivers, you know, something as simple as that. Well, the school district tries to hire them, the school, school district tries to train them, and Manatee County government hires them away from us. <laughs> <laughs> not just Manatee County, Sarasota County government does the same thing, and so does the school district of Sarasota County, because they all pay more than the school district of Manatee County pays. So that just is, I'm saying those things just to kind of give you a, an idea of the size and the scope of those numbers. Now, at the end of the day, the school district is going to meet its budget. As it continues forward, services are going to continue to improve. And the goal is also that the quality of the education in this, of the students in this community also improves. So the real question there is not are these things going to happen, because they are going to happen. And you know this conversation is happening a little early, because it would be nice if it was later when you could see some of these things really taking hold. But the real question is, what pace, at what pace do those changes happen? Now, I mentioned a little bit about the, the funding discrepancies. So, you know, from a business standpoint, if you look at just Manatee County compared to Sarasota County, Sarasota County General Fund is about 4% larger than the Manatee County School District General Fund. It serves approximately 10% fewer students than the Manatee County School District. And you kind of wonder, how does that happen? Well, they have the dedicated uh, one mill. And one mill is property tax. It's, an, it's a millage on top of the required local effort. And in Sarasota County, that millage generates about $44 million is about what it's going to be. And the voters of Sarasota County are going to go to the polls on the 25th of March, and they're going to decide if they're going to renew it for another four years. What do they use that for? Well, in Sarasota County, it funds, I think, around 457 positions. Most of them are in the schools. It, it funds things like science and technology. It funds art and music teachers. It provides resources to schools. It's, it actually helps to fund the school resource officers in Sarasota County. They're funded out of the regular general fund in Manti County, but with what the Manti County School District gets in Sarasota County, they've got the one mill and they spend that money to fund that, which frees up other money to do other things for, for the students. In 2010, Sarasota County looked at, you know, the, the question was, what happens if they don't do it? And I think one of the things I saw, I think it was in the Herald Tribune, was that if they didn't get it, they would have to probably do something like, it would be like they'd have to do a 13% pay cut to deal with the loss of that funding, all right, 13% pay cut. Now realistically, if they don't get it, what's going to happen is they're going to probably have to reduce services. They may have to reduce salaries. And let me tell you something, as a guy who has cut salaries, that's not fun. You do what you have to do to try and make sure you meet your budget. But it's not something that's fun to do, I can assure you that. It's not your first choice. So why is all this important to business in Manatee County? Well, at the next meeting, I think you'll be hearing some stuff about what Manatee County government is doing. They're working on how will we grow. They're looking at how do we have to do things if we want to be a successful community in the future. The, the Chamber of Commerce, the EDC, they're actively pursuing corporate customers to move their headquarters to Manatee County. They're trying to bring new businesses, good businesses to Manatee County. And part and parcel with all that is a quality public education system. Now, the school district is increasing accountability. The school district has got a lock on their budget. I feel pretty confident that the budget is under control. There's always going to be little things that happen, but it's pretty well under control. The school district has been doing surveys of staff, of parents, of the community. What are the priorities? The school district is working on a strategic plan to try and outline the roadmap for how this district needs to go forward. And when you get in, and, and all those things are going to generate prioritization and alignment of funds to make sure we focus them on those, re, those resources that need to be focused on. Questions will be asked, they should be asked. Um, but at the end, the board has to work with the superintendent and staff to try and make those things happen in a positive way and in the right way. 
But at the end of that process, under the current scenario, all that will can be done in Mantee County School District is still going to be operating with $44 million a year less than what the other Sarasota County offers for its students. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not here to tell you that you just throw money at the problem. When the school district has some of the highest salaries for teachers in the state of Florida, our academic achievement was going the wrong way. You can't just throw money at a problem. That's not the right way to do it, and that is not the way the district is trying to do it now. But when the district develops a roadmap for this community to show what it's going to do, then the question becomes, at what pace do you want the district to progress down that road? You know, as a business owner and as business owners, you know that if you want to have your business thrive, you have to be willing to invest in that business. Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting yanked. If you want a thriving business, you got to invest in it. If you want a thriving community, you need a quality public education system. And if you know nothing else, if you want a quality public education system, you need to be willing to invest in it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm ready to duck after that talk. <laughs> I'm gonna hold on to my back pocket. <laughs> first of all, I'd like to thank Tiger Bay for inviting me to your group tonight. <clears throat> this is the first opportunity I've had to appear and speak here or talk to some of you people. Many of you I know, some of you I don't. But for the benefit of those that don't know me, I've lived in Manatee County for 62 years, like this gentleman here stated about the history of Manatee County. I didn't come here in a horse and buggy, but wasn't too far behind. Manatee County, when we came here, as well as Sarasota County, was total as 25,000 people, total. And I represent the Federation of Manatee County Community Associations, which is an organization that celebrated its 50th year in existence this past, a week ago Wednesday, at the American Legion Hall on 75th Street. And the Federation is just like your organization in a lot of ways. The only difference is uh, you're the new kid on the block, but we've been doing what you've been doing for 50 years. And what I mean by that is we're a quality of life organization that dedicates itself, and what I've done, dedicated myself to give back to this community and not just act as a professional here. I've been a trial lawyer for 48 years. I'm semi-retired, or supposed to be, and uh, I still am active. I'm the longest active member of the Federation. I've been in it 45 years. So I've been involved with dealing with quality of life issues such as what you've heard here today. And it touches everything from the environment to law enforcement to the judicial system to environment, you name it, education, big item. We have people that attend standing committees that uh, and serve the school board as advisory to their sales tax accountability committee. We have done that. We've also served on their budget <coughs> review committee. We also go to workshops that the county has each year on their budget. We've been invited to do that. We give written recommendations to them. And by that, we're able to help our officials make good decisions to continue to make this a good quality of life community for all of us. That's why I live here. That's why you live here. Now, what is the answer to lawmakers uh, using physical responsibility? as the term is. is it, can you hear me all right out there? Okay. Uh, definition of a lawmaker, in my opinion, includes all of us. Any public official, whether he's on a school board, city council, county commission, state legislator, or in Congress, are lawmakers because you're always making decisions that in fact uh, impact either your lives personally or the community that you live in. So you begin from the standpoint of how you control physical responsibility by lawmakers, all of us, in your own home. If you have a car and it needs repairs, do you go out and buy a new car or do you repair it? Well, the answer to that is how much money you got in your back pocket. If you can't buy a new car, the obvious answer is go fix the car until you can afford to buy a new one. And if you don't have the money to fix the car, then you got a choice. You either do without and get a bicycle or use public transportation or you walk. But the point is, fiscal responsibility starts with every one of us from the standpoint of our public officials in our own home and works out from there. 
And whether you are in the professional ranks or in business, I've been in business since I was nine years old. I went to work in the streets of Detroit when I was nine years old because we were so poor then at that time, we couldn't afford uh, for me not to do it. And I was on welfare until I was 16 years old and I lived in foster homes. So I came through all that. Everybody's got a great story of some kind that happens to be part of mine. But I'm telling you, I found out real quick what a penny was worth. And I know what a dollar is worth today. And I know what it takes to have fiscal responsibility in my home, in my business, and in my community. And I've made it a point to find these things out and do something about it if and when and in the proper way I can do it. Now, the examples of uh, what I've just gave you, whether it's your house, if your house needs uh, repairs because the roof's leaking, do you buy a new house? No, you fix the roof. Same thing with our government. You've got to start thinking this way. And these are the recommendations we've made to the school board and to the county of commission over the past several years. If we don't have the money to buy new cars, fix up the ones we got, or trucks, or equipment. It doesn't make any difference. But you've got to think down this line. You can't think that you've got a printing press in the basement like the federal government has, and you go in there and start printing money, whether it's for your home or for your community here. That kind of thinking is part of why I won't say it's totally uh, responsible for the economic uh, morass that we have right now, but it, the government, federal government has had a habit of spending more than they take in and they can afford to spend. And it's like people with a credit card that don't have sense enough to quit charging against it because someday they've got to start paying it off and they can't. And that's what's happened to uh, this country. So when you start thinking about it from a local level to a national level, <clears throat> our credit card is full, folks. And we've got to start talking to our public officials here and tell it to the next person. We've got to start going to workshops and give contribution by way of information to our public officials to help them make good decisions, not stick spears in their heart. Our idea about the Federation is we don't endorse candidates because we don't know who's going to get elected. And we do care about who gets elected because we can individually support them, but the organization does not. Our job is to help our officials make good decisions. And that's my story for you today about what we think as an organization that you might want to think about with this organization. And I commend you. This organization, our organization, represents what this county is all about. We've got a lot of great service organizations in this county, and they all contribute to make it a good community. We're at the threshold, major decisions. We have a 370,000 population now that we've got to deal with and address the needs of these people in this community. And we can't do it by just coming to a meeting and sitting here thinking about it. We've got to get involved going out to some of these organizations or go to the county meetings or the school board meetings. Uh, it's like I said last week when I spoke at our celebration. Government is run by those people who show up. And that doesn't mean just a small group. It means a lot of people need to get out once in a while and go to the meetings and say something about what they think. And if you don't, then you got no business complaining. So I want to close with, and I don't want to get jerked off the podium here by my worthy uh, moderator here, but uh, I think that uh, it's important that you give thought to how you can help our officials make good decisions locally. Because if you can do it locally, you can pass it on to the fed, feds, to the state, the state legislators meeting up there. We give them a wish list of about 12 items every year, and we highlight two or three that we think are important. These are the kind of steps that we need to do. Manatee County has got to grow with sustainable growth, not unsustainable growth. And we can't do it if we don't think logically about how we develop. We got 50 states and we can't dump 50 states where the people into Florida and Manatee County. You couldn't pave enough pavement or put up enough houses to cover that. And if you did that, you wouldn't have any green grass left if you start paving every foot of ground we got and put a house on it. So we have to think about what we can afford. Do we put up a barrier and say, no, you can't come in? No, we control how we will grow, which is what the county's working on. And we're endeavoring to help them make good decisions on it, and I urge this organization to do the same. Is that enough talking, Larry? Okay. okay. Thank you.
First thing I want to do is uh, thank the Manate uh, Manatee Tire Bay Club for the opportunity to come here and speak to, to uh, everyone today. Uh, it's my uh, first time speaking here and hopefully it won't be the last. Uh, I want to personally thank uh, Judy and the others uh, for your courtesy and your hospitality. Uh, here is the question. Is it prudent to ask the people of Manatee County to pay more, which is really a question about the size of government that we want to have. So before I answer the question, uh, I think everyone needs to be reminded of some historical perspectives and beliefs. Uh, the simple question of paying more and the size of government really transcends our county. Goes to the state, goes to the government level. Now I'm going to give you a quote. Government is not reason. Government is not eloquence. Government is force. That is a quote by George Washington that he made during his presidency. It is a perspective that I hold today, as does all constitutional conservatives. Our founding fathers knew that government was power and control. Power and control over the people, and as such should only be sparingly granted by the people and their representatives. Inherent in the Constitution, there is what I call the liberty equation. On one side of the equation, we have individual liberties, and on the other side, we have government control. The equation is not a balanced scale. It's not proportional. But it is a zero-sum equation. Whatever is added to one side is taken away from the other side. This liberty equation should be overwhelmingly weighted on the side of individual liberty. That's what our founding fathers wanted. But that is far from what we have today. At the county level, the city level, the village level, the state level, and definitely the federal level. Essentially, we have the opposite. Government regulates almost every aspect of our lives. And the primary role of government in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence is to protect our individual liberties. That's our primary goal in those documents. It is not to rule us, but they have forgotten that. We need to put power back in the hands of the people where it belongs. It should be abundantly clear that, to everyone that the government cannot give anything to anybody without taking away something from somebody else. It cannot grant itself some power without subtracting it from the people. Every time the government gets bigger and gets more powerful, it diminishes the power of the people. That is not the way it was envisioned by our founding fathers. We need to celebrate liberty again. We need to scorn big government. We need to empower the individual again. We need to become more liberty-minded, more liberty-focused, and more constitutionally oriented. Many of our government officials firmly believe that every problem in society that arises has to be solved by the government. It's their first thought and sometimes their only thought. 
They never think of the individual people. They never think of society in general as solving their own problems. It's always the government. As Ronald Reagan famously said, government is not the solution, it is the problem. We need to stop creating and nurturing dependency on governments at all levels, and we have to bring back personal responsibility. We need to return to maximum individual liberty and minimum government intrusion in our lives. That's what our founding fathers wanted, and that's why they framed the Constitution the way they did. Now, when it comes to specific spending in Manatee County and the apprehension people have about that spending, all, they, all anyone has to do is to, in understanding their feelings, is to go to the state audit report, which was published this last December for the Manatee County Schools. It covers a five-year period, which was before the current superintendent, Rick Mills, took over. That state legislative auditing committee that reviewed that audit report had some very telling comments. And I want to read a few of those comments. Number one, and a senator said, the Manatee School District is a poster child for financial mismanagement. Another representative said, this is the one, this is one of the most appalling things I've heard. A senator said, I'm embarrassed as a Floridian that such conduct took place. And lastly, Senator Hayes called upon the superintendent, Rick Mills, to look into the possibility of criminal charges. This is where we stand with our schools today. We got a long ways to go. These conclusions, the audit report, and the uh, comments by the committee, these conclusions are damning. But worse yet, the citizens were waving the red flags of malfeasance, of neglect, of egregious poor management. They knew the numbers didn't add up. And they essentially told everyone on the board and the school superintendent, but they were ignored. In fact, when they got too close to the truth, they were shut out. No more access to detailed financial information. They simply got the runaround. The five years of this audit were not just evidence of incompetence. They were evidence of intentional deceit, deception, and dishonesty. Now, let me go to another topic. The infamous half-penny school sales tax increase of 2002. It was billed as a promise. And I've got the original flyer right here. The half penny will allow us to stop using portables as permanent classrooms. Well, Exhibit F of the Sales Tax Committee update noted of the 158 portables, 2002, that were used as permanent classrooms, only two have been eliminated using the sales tax proceeds. Next, they made a promise. We're gonna build 18 new schools, including four new high schools. That's what this sales tax is going to give us. So far to date, they've built two high schools. 
Now, the people of Manatee County have lost their trust and confidence in government officials. The people have become quite suspicious of their intentions and question their integrity. Government, those government officials have to earn back that trust. And they are, slowly but surely. And we have to congratulate a lot of the people on the school board and Rick Mills uh, for doing so. Uh, they have to become more transparent and they have to be more open to the people's input. Manatee County has to start living within their means and they have to prove to the people of Manatee that they cannot that they can be good stewards of the people's money before they ask for any more money. And uh, I have a few more, but I guess the bell is wrong. <laughs> I want to thank you. Uh, opportunity pauser. Yeah, I want to thank you uh, for this opportunity again. Yeah. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay, it's time for questions, and once more, if you have a question, you go to the mic, you say your name, that you're a member of Tiger Bay, and get to your question. You can direct it to any person on the panel, and the panelists know that additional people on the panel, if they want to speak to that same question, may do so. So, Marla Huff with Huff Engineering, and I'm a Tiger Bay member. My question is for Mike Howe. Um, you talked about paying at the pump for roads, and... We've always been a donor state here in Florida, and just if you could update us um, on what we pay and what we get back, and then one more further thing, you talked about futuristic, how we're trying to base it, what we pay at the pump based on what our mileage is driven. If we were to go to such a system, would that um, donor situation still be in play? Good questions. You know, Florida's been uh, one of those states, and when we use the term donor state, it means that we send more gas tax revenue <clears throat> up to uh, Washington, D.C. than we get back in return from the federal government. So we collect it at the pump, and we're only getting back traditionally about 88 cents on the dollar of gas tax that is paid. Um, that, there was a, you know, a concerted effort by the Florida legislative uh, uh, congressman uh, here several years ago to try to increase that to at least a level of 90 or 92 cents, which doesn't sound like a lot of increase, but it, it means another 500,000 or a million uh, dollars, you know, in the, in the state budget, um, and that didn't happen. Um, it, it, it's still languishing down around 88 cents. As far as uh, your second question, you know, what's the future of that? Uh, I, I think that, uh, and I'm sorry, re repeat that again, Marla. Well, you had said they bandied about ideas about um, paying based on what your usage of the road is, where they'd know how oh, many would miles it, you'd would driven. Would that alleviate the donor status? Uh, potentially, you know, it, you're still going to have to make tough policy decisions. If you go to a a mileage driven, you know, charge, you know, similar to a utility charge, you're still going to have to figure out what that charge is. And th there's lots of ideas that are bandied about saying that, well, people that use the interstate, uh, including the freight industry, which I'm sure is a chagrin to them, you know, maybe they should pay more for miles driven on the interstate than they should for a local roadway, you know, going up to your local Publix. So it, 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 it's a policy decision that is still un, undetermined at this point, Marla, but good questions. And, and I wanted to say one thing on that, that point. Uh, the reason that we're in this state right now is uh, basically because uh, we've done a good job of making our cars more fuel efficient. So we're not paying as, we don't need as much gas. So, you know, the gas declines have gone down. You know, back in 1980, the, the gas, average gas mileage was uh, 
20 miles per gallon for, for your cars. Now it's you know approaching 35 to 40. Yeah. So there, there's, there's no mystery here. That's why we're in the situation. Yeah, we're in for losing. Yeah. <laughs> um, Betsy? Hi, I'm Betsy Banak. I'm a county commissioner and I'm a member. And I often think when it comes to the school board, and I really appreciate y'all coming forward and talking. Um, it's not easy to do given our situation. But I always think when it comes to the school board, there but by, by the grace of God go I. You know, if, if we were told such bad information, how do you make good decisions? And I, I think that's what happened. But my question is, is clearly we were spending more money than we had. We were clearly spending more money than we had. Why was that? Were we trying to keep up with a school system that we couldn't afford? I mean, if that's the case, then what do we do? Um, you know, we, I have two kids that went through the school system here and, you know, it, it makes me nervous. You know, if our, if our school system is so poor, we can't attract good jobs. I know I'm making a speech, yeah. but that's my question. Was it the fact that, you know, we were, we didn't have the money, so we pretended like we did? Is that what we did? I mean, and it, was that the case? I'll just ask okay. that. Bob, take it away. <laughs> Well, um, no, I, I, well, I'm not sure why we were spending, you know, that there was any deliberate thing as to any one thing. The, uh, the audit finding, and we did, you know, the school district spent a boatload of money to have an audit done, a forensic audit done by an FBI investigator, and uh, to actually look into that. And, uh, did you have any more cheaters? Sorry. So first, I just wanted to kind of let you see. Specifically, what the board said is we wanted them to say what caused the deficit, what was the, when was it identified, who was aware of the deficit, what efforts, if any, were made to avoid the deficit, what efforts to notify management and the board for, of the deficit, provide recommendations to provide early warnings to management and board for, for future um, uh, shortfalls. They really kind of focus on a lot of different things, but I, you know, they, they identified that Mr. Drake made a lot of mistakes. Uh, they identified that uh, the fact that position control wasn't turned on uh, allowed a lot of mistakes. So if you, you know, how did this district spend too much? Well, they weren't encumbering it. In other words, people were just, it was kind of a culture, you know, the district, it's, as this last year's gone, it was sort of a culture of the district will fix the problem. And so uh, department leaders, school site uh, leaders were not necessarily being held accountable for managing their own budgets. And it just seems like, and, and as I already mentioned, there's over 10,000 lines of code in the, in the budget. There's over 216 million combinations of costs in those codes. And, and the district was trying to do it in a very manual fashion, and it was apparently just getting out of control and overwhelming. And you've heard the comment made about how, you know, district staff quit trying to answer all the questions. Well, actually, what started to happen is district staff was spending all of their time trying to answer questions. And every time they gave an answer to a question, it wasn't a good enough answer and district staff was going back and spending more time answering the question. And pretty soon, in my opinion, part of the problem, certainly not all the problem, is district staff was spending all the time answering questions and not doing their job. Which, as we now recognize, and as Superintendent Mills has, has uh, acknowledged that, you know, it's a very labor intensive process we've got and we do need to update that and make a lot of it more automated. So, you know, uh, it was just a lot of faulty systems. The uh, investigator looked at it, you know, the question of criminal, uh, they actually answered that and the answer they gave was, uh, let me see if I've got that here. And this is the FBI investigator who said, the investigation concluded that former assistant superintendent Jim Drake failed to provide adequate supervision and oversight of the budget process, which, which resulted in budget short, shortfalls that ultimately resulted in the deficit not being detected until after the end of the fiscal year. The investigation did not develop any information indicating that funds of the district had been stolen or misappropriated as a result of any criminal or illegal activity. That's what the FBI investigator came back with. So it's, it's a lot of things. I asked your chairman if I could comment on this because I sat in on the Citizens Review Committee, it actually comprised of citizens plus staff uh, making recommendations to the uh, uh, superintendent. And that's what was the purpose in the, of the uh, committee. And 
One of the questions that was posed at the last of the um, year that I served before all the problems broke was we were told and we were represented to by the superintendent then and his staff that there was a approximately $10 million hole that would have to be filled between when we adjourned and the coming budget coming up. So when we came back the next year to start the process again of the workshops, I asked the question, what happened to filling that hole? And it grew from 10 to about $16 million. I said, what happened to that hole? And I was told and informed by our then superintendent and his staff that the problem was resolved. It was down to $3 million. And before we finished with our workshops, that that would be eliminated. As it turned out, what you've heard explained to you today is what happened. So what I'm trying to tell you, we didn't get into these thousands of pages, if you will, the budget. We made recommendations. We left that to the staff to do. And quite frankly, I'm not pointing a finger at any particular person on that staff, but I'm saying to you, they were very polite, very nice people, but we were misled. And this county was misled, unfortunately. And it's unfortunate because these people were charged with the responsibility of doing it right. Okay. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Dr. Jim Whitman. I am a correctional psychiatrist, including at the Manatee County Jail. Uh, we're talking a lot about schools today, which I think is appropriate because it's the biggest line item in the county budget. Uh, and so my question is for Mr. Gauze. And, pos uh, and forgive my naivete, but it would, uh, I would appreciate knowing, since in the United States, we spend more per, per uh, student than any other country in the world, I'm, I'm inquiring about uh, school choice, which may be a way of holding down costs and improving outcomes. Uh, public charter and private school choice. What is the status in Manatee County? And if Mr. Marshall could possibly address the issue statewide. Thank you very much. Yes, and they will do so briefly. <laughs> I think I spoke too long, sorry, yeah, twice. Okay. Um, Everybody does it. Short answer is school choice is alive and well in Manatee County School District. In fact, uh, it's been going on for quite a while. My son actually attended a charter school when he was in middle school, um, and, and they did a great job. So. There is a lot of choice. It's provided for. The school district of Manatee County probably has as many charter schools at per capita of, of, of any district in the state of Florida. Um, so uh, the competition is good. My attitude is I want the school district of Manatee County to be the best. Thanks. On the state level, to my knowledge, the charter school, school choice concept is well and doing fine throughout the state. There are areas and pockets in the state like any place where it's not doing as well as it could or should. But it's being looked at. Charter schools, uh, school choice, all these different types of schools that we have in the county have made a valuable contribution to the concept of education. Education doesn't have to be in a building. You can do it in a room. That's why homeschooling is successful. They don't use huge buildings. Okay, come on up. My name is Becky Kness, and I'm the CEO of Just for Girls and the Just for Girls Academy. I wanna ask you about the public-private partnerships that you mentioned, and the value within the budgets in that regard, and the ways that we could explore transportation initiatives when you have Manatee County government you have the school district, and you have so many private before and after school programs and other schools, all with their fleets of vehicles, that if we could all come together in a transportation collaboration, we could save a small fortune. So could you explore that and give me your ideas on it? Was that for Mr. Gauss? Gauss? For anyone okay. as well, because well, we'll it, it does involve Manatee County Briefly. as well. <laughs> I think it's a great idea, and uh, you know I think it is worth looking into. We do have a lot of different options available that 
may be able to work together, uh, not only in the physical transportation, but also in the maintenance of, of those fleets. So there's, there's opportunities there, and I think that the uh, superintendent and his team, uh, you know, actively, and, and the county administrator actively look to see where they can identify um, partnership and cost savings. I'm glad to hear you say that. The superintendent and the deputy superintendents are very open in exploring it. And I, I was wondering about the priorities of the panel members here today. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Okay. We have time for, oh yes, okay, I'm sorry. Then we'll have our last question after you. Sure. Yeah, just to uh, explore it a little bit further. Uh, Sarasota Manatee Metropolitan Planning Organization also administers a state program. We have uh, appointed officials that manage this uh, on both Manatee and Sarasota side, which is a local coordinating board. Uh, it, it's both for the transportation disadvantaged, uh, which, you know, need to get transportation to doctor's offices and the grocery stores and things like that, but also for senior population, elderly, and for youth that need, you know, some type of uh, assistance. And there's, a, there's a, a capital aspect of it where you can fund some uh, transportation fleet, you know, uh, vehicles, and there's also an operating side to it. Not a lot of money like anything, but uh, there is money available. So I would encourage you maybe to, uh, you know, check with us and, and see if we could uh, be of some assistance. And I'll talk to you after the meeting about contact. Okay, Dr. Connard, you asked the last question. Yes, uh, Dick Connard, I'm a retired physician. I am a member. Uh, in building on what we've heard today, uh, in the last analysis, the responsibility for our school district rests with the school board. We as citizens elect them and we expect them not to abrogate their responsibilities and then point to others for that. My question to you, Mr. Gauze, would be what specific initiatives and solutions is the board putting in place to assure us that we're not going to experience what we're going through right now? Um, two things. One is I need to probably clarify my previous comment. I don't know that the superintendent and the county administrator are actually discussing that right now, but I am open to it. And I know that our superintendent and county administrator do try to regularly meet to talk about issues where the, the two can cooperate on things. So, you know, that can just be another thing that they can be talking about if they're not already. With regard to what is the board doing, it's the biggest thing the board did already, and people sometimes forget the board's role, is the board hired a new superintendent and allowed that superintendent to bring in a team that he felt comfortable with, okay? That's, that's the biggest thing the board could do. The other thing the board did is they let the, had the Florida Association of uh, School Superintendents come in and review the whole situation and make recommendations. And then the next thing the board also did was the board um, followed those recommendations. <laughs> they, they listened to what those recommendations were. And the, so the board created a situation, and, and they've reached out to the community. The board created a situation where we looked at what the problems were, we asked informed, intelligent people to, to help give us guidance. We listened to that guidance. The superintendents brought in his team. And, uh, you know, probably the best way to know that the uh, budget is uh, under control is to look at the financial reports that come out every month. Uh, they always did. But one of the things that's different now is that the superintendent's team is now identifying what the encumbered amount is, so that you can actually see what the projection is at the end based on the current spending and the projected spending, you can see it. So it's become very transparent for anybody who wants to look. Any further comment? All right. Well, this brings us to the close of another Tiger Bay. Uh, please join if you haven't, and please renew if you haven't. Thank you so much for coming out on this rainy day. Thanks to our panel. You were all excellent, stayed within your time, did a great job. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you next month when we'll be talking about infill in uh, how we plan for the future of our uh, space. So take care. <laughs>